When we think about coming up with a partnership or an initiative or for innovation related projects, how do you define what is the right project size with the right project team with the right project data set? Right. So, for example, um, do we start really, really big and just do all at once and involve all the teams and go through one big innovation push? Or should we do micro innovation sprints um, on various different topics? What has been your all's experience when it comes to thinking about the right approach to starting a partnership or something? Actually, let's start with you. So I think it goes back to something Brandon said earlier about the size of the opportunity or the problem. Um, I think if you can start small, you can fail small. So that's always a good place to start. But I also think it's about the complexity of the innovation. So mapping out the technologies that you think are gonna be a part of the innovation, I think is very important. So if you have an innovation where you're going to need a lot of data, maybe data engineering help. If you think you're going to need AIML, you may need data science or machine learning engineers to be a part of it. It could be IIoT, and you need to bring together those skill sets as well. Um, really, first getting a sense of the application or the technology landscape that you need will help you size how big of a team you need, what kind of resources are important. But then also, what does the change management look like on the other side of a successful POC? So what kind of change are you introducing? I think it's a part of an innovation team or organization to be a part of the adoption process. It doesn't stop at a POC. It really needs to be a part of, of going through the scaling process and enabling, depending on how your organization is structured, but the, the, the organization that's going to help scale that adoption. The innovation um, team or, or however the organization is structured needs to be there to help move that along. Because there is, there is the human aspect of it. I know we talk a lot about technology, but we should never forget that it's the people that we're doing these innovations for. And so we have to think about like design thinking and, and how these innovations are going to impact them. So I think you have to size it. There's a technology piece and then there's the organizational change management and people side of it. Um, and having that sort of not, let's say, spelled out, but a high level look at what you think you might need, I think influences a lot on on what what size of projects, resources you need. And then and lastly, I would say the complexity, which is, I think, a combination of all of those. But if you if you were looking at things like the clearness, if it, like two axes, like clearness of vision versus complexity of the project, um, those two dimensions, I think, will also help. If you have a very clear project with high complexity, I think you bring a one kind of team to that. Whereas if you have, um, you know, a low clarity in the vision, and, and low complexity, that might be a, a different team that you bring to that kind of project. As a leader, when you s go on these journeys um, to solve specific innovation problems and you bring in partners, do you normally tend to keep them isolated to a specific function, let's say it's operations or something, you know, do you keep it that, well, let's start with this and we'll fork one, we'll start, start to end on that one function, or do you say, okay, I'm gonna do one here, one here, one here, and then I'm going to evaluate based on how things are coming together. Like, what is that? Your walk us through your mindset when you're sort of thinking through or developing a plan. Well, I think it's all about the business need. Okay. It all starts with the business need in my mind. So, if it's something that we are trying to solve a pain point for a very particular part of the organization, and it's isolated, the the partners or the internal resources that we'll try to create in that team will be focused on that particular department. Maybe they'll have ancillary skill sets, you know, or tangential, you know, to that particular domain, but we're gonna look for those skills that we need to bring to that. If it's something more broad where we think there's multiple different functional areas that are gonna be, be affected, you know, we're gonna take a different strategy to that. We might find a partner that has more capabilities within their, their portfolio of offerings um, that can help satisfy that so that we're reducing the amount of um, administrative work that has to be done to getting multiple partners to sync up to get to a particular. So outcome. you really are segmenting your approach based on the needs and the requirements and the effect that will have on the organization as a whole. That's pretty interesting. Brandon, what about you? Just kind of thinking through what Afshin had, had said and kind of what we've learned through the School of Hard Knocks. I, so I think it's critical that like a lot of feedback we kind of get through our changes. Hey, there's too much change in the organization. And I think what we failed to communicate is 
It's, it's not all individual chains. It's all chains that kind of bolts together, if you will, to complete this overall you know, vision at the end. And we haven't done a great job, but hey, this is really a program with a whole bunch of individual projects taking place to get to the end result, right? And we've got to get better at that entire process through theirs, right? And, and they're small individual projects, so it's not, 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 not just one big change. And then it comes, as it comes to partners, I, I'm going to go back to it's almost like a, it's almost a little bit of an art and a little bit of a mix of science in there as we, as, we, as we think about where we use partners strategically and where we maybe help, let them help us on the individual building blocks. If they come in and they've got capabilities that it maybe expand past what we scoped them for, we might say, hey, would you come over here and help us on this other project? Your insight might be pretty valuable over there. And that's proved pretty successful. And we've also had partners that was like, eh, we'll keep you right here in this project. You're doing this good. And this is really the only skills that you have. We're going to keep you here and, and, and limit your exposure to the other projects we have going on. This is about execution. These might be more more innovative and more yeah. creative. And, and I think and that's a really good point. Um, it, it's not as formulaic as maybe I, I articulated it to be. There is there is a lot of art and you have to be flexible. Um, again, especially through the innovation process, there's a lot of things through the execution that, that you just aren't going to know and you have to have that degree of flexibility. And then you also learn more about your partners as you, you do. work with them. Yeah, like, oh, definitely. you guys are actually really good at that. We could use you over here. Absolutely. Yeah, so. yeah when I think around how you select like the right size of the team, the right size of the problem, um, <clears throat> there, there's really not in my mind a good way to do that. <clears throat> the only thing, because I've tried all, I've tried all of them. Yeah. I've tried going big. <laughs> um, there's caveats with every single approach. You want to take on a big problem, you have more complexities. You want to bring a lot of perspectives in, great. You have more opinions to manage. Uh, you want to go really narrow and nimble and make some progress. Well, then you're in, you're putting bias into the equation. You know, you pick your your caveat that you want to deal with. But what I have seen to work the best is make sure to align a project, uh, a magnitude of the problem that aligns with the likelihood your company will gain momentum and support around it. So if you don't have the structure or the ecosystem or the culture or whatever it may be that will allow you to progress something really big and disruptive, you may have a team that actually comes up with a solution. So let's say they get a one in a million type solution and they find the technology, they find the approach and it, it's gonna work. The organization might look at it and say, yeah, probably not for us. You know, so I, and that just puts frustration on everybody. So I, I just say find something that aligns with the company's approach currently. Um, and you can make little incremental steps here versus trying to hope for something truly disruptive. That's kind of my biggest piece of advice in that space. I 100% I, I agree with what you're saying. But at the same time, I wonder if that's right for the industry. Yeah, I don't know. I, you know I, I, it, it feels like sometimes we need a big, a, a big transformational change. Like we don't have, maybe we don't have time to incrementally change to get somewhere. I don't have an answer for that. I think that is it's just spot a feeling. On. You know? Yeah, I think it's spot on. I think that big push has to come from outside the industry. Yeah, very well. I good. think I think you have to feel uh, the disruption, so mm -hmm. to speak. I yeah. Like once you feel it, and, and you know, it's like the the adage of attack from below. Like when you feel like you're being attacked, then you then you start really driving for some some real disruptive change. But until then, I mean, the business model is fantastic. You know, we're, we, we as an industry are supplying uh, energy in a very um, very capable way, very efficient way, very affordable in the scheme of things. And, and it's hard to really disrupt that unless there's a reason to disrupt that. So I think we need that disruption as a whole industry to really start moving down that path to start looking for those. Because otherwise, you might get a little more comfortable in a, a defined business model for a longer period of time as an industry. And we see many on the horizon right now as sure, well, right? Absolutely. Like there, there is energy transition, there is energy security, there is geopolitical concerns, uh, energy affordability, accessibility. I mean, there's all these things that are out there right now, right? And uh, But just having the conviction to stand behind a vision and say, okay, I need to change that. And then a systematic approach to do that, right? I, it's again, it can be messy, but let's be structured about it, right? I really like that. I think that's a, a good point in that. I think you have to see that catalyst play out to really prompt you, to, yeah. to really push into something more disruptive than say, you know, just an incremental or sustaining. Yeah, I wish there wasn't, but I think you're right. Oh, yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Like, like everybody's comfortable like they are. I mean, you know, life is pretty good in the scheme of things. But um, but I do think you need some form of disruption to really have that desire for bigger disruptive Correct. change versus just the incremental change. You know, one area that I think could, could be different to that is if um, an incumbent player decided to do things differently mm -hmm. and, and brought a competitive element to it where the change was more as a function of how efficient they were, um, maybe it reduced the, these innovations, reduced their cost of capital in the market, uh, provided opportunities. And I think that's, you know, one area where, you know, rather than sort of let's call the macro 
forces coming at the industry, you know, a, a player who chose to take the risk and, and do something materially different could put those pressures on the organization internally, um, rather the industry, not the organization, but the industry. But finding a leader to champion such an incumbent in an environment that is reeling from multiple shocks after shocks after shocks, I think that's the biggest limitation in many. And generally, you wouldn't find an incumbent that is doing particularly well that is willing to undertake that endeavor. Yeah, it's a new entrant. Usually, usually either that or you have an incumbent that has kind of fallen to an under performer that yeah. then has very little to lose. They're, yeah. they're essentially kind of a startup at that point in time. So I think that could be something that happens at some point down the line. Great conversation. My last point that I'd like to sort of discuss uh, from my perspective, and it's going to be, again, something that I'm really, really passionate about, this whole concept of uh, multi-partner partnerships or a open innovation ecosystem with multiple partnerships. And in those sort of constructs, um, how do you think having, what is it? purpose-driven partnerships in that construct. How do you establish them? How do you make sure that when you want to go on this a little bit of a big journey, right? You're taking many people with you and you want to align them to your thinking. How do you do like walk me through some of your thinking as you go through that journey? Yeah, I can I can jump in. I have a lot of passion around open collaboration and, and how we approach that. Um, not just from an industry perspective, but a societal perspective as well. You know, when, when you embark upon open collaboration, you're giving up a lot. You're giving up com potentially competitive advantage. You're giving up the IP. Uh, you're giving up first to market type opportunities, but you're advancing an industry, you're advancing society so much faster. You know, the, the capability to leverage not just a handful of, of intelligent individuals, but a large group, a whole industry's worth of intelligent individuals, there's value to be had everywhere. Sure, you, you might not be the high flyer, but you're much likely to be better off than you would be otherwise if you just went in alone. So I'm a big proponent of open collaboration. I truly believe that um, industry partnerships is probably the way of the future. Um, so discrete companies, but, but true partnerships with commitments back to each other, I feel like that is probably the, the direction the industry is heading in the next two to three years. Absolutely. I think that you need to know where you want to go. Right. You have to have your your destination. Maybe it's not perfectly clear, but there needs to be a direction. I think to have a purpose driven partnership, you need to know what the purpose yes, is. Yes. Exactly. <laughs> right. You need, you need alignment on that. And, you, and you need alignment <laughs> yep. and you need some clarity um, and you, you need expectations to be defined. Again, not rigid. Mm -hmm. Right. But a framework that allows a partnership. to be But, but a meaningful work. purpose, a, a meaningful purpose, yeah. um, whatever that might be for the organization. I think that's the first place to start. When we talk about innovation, that can be really ambiguous. Um, it can be very difficult to, to kind of communicate and, and be tangible in a way that you can translate that into something that, you know, is easily written down on paper. But I think that that's a critical thing to start working through. Um, you know, I think sometimes partnerships can evolve from more transactional to purpose driven. Um, if that's the desire of the, of the organization. And sometimes that might be a good way to start, right? Get, get to know the partner to some of the things that, that Brandon and Ben were saying earlier. Get to know that partner. As things become more clear, you may find that as, as, a, as an opportunity to move forward. But I, I do think you have to have what that guiding North Star is so that you can set clear expectations. Because I think, I think if expectations and alignment get out of whack, partnerships you know can erode more value than they were intended to create so i, I really like where you head with that you got to have clear expectations and then kind of been a point you touched on earlier and i wonder if it would apply to this would you want a third party to facilitate that partnership like, and when you come together do you want a neutral third party that's there to help facilitate to make sure you're both heading towards that north star and just you know just an idea to make. yeah i think you have to have some some form of facilitation yeah. there kind of back to where i was going earlier like most good innovation you have people doing innovating you have people pitching you have people selling um but you need somebody to facilitate too to help pull all those various pieces together like you know passing the baton is usually where it gets dropped so i, I think that is absolutely critical um on the alignment of like expectations what you're going for that is the hardest part it is without a doubt the hardest <laughs> sure. part yes and i'll give an example too it like, is very um, challenging like even in my day to day, uh, I'm, I'm primarily at the, the Midland Basin and I look around at competitors and I'll look at other other operators and, and how they're doing things. And I'll look at their development approach, how they're drilling wells and how they're producing. And I'll look at it and it is just night and day different than how 
my, my team's doing it. It's just completely different. And then I look at the results and they're very good too. Like, you know, I work with exceptionally talented people and results are very good across the board. But then you look at somebody else and their organization and they're doing it very differently. So it like those two different perspectives then have to come together and find some form of alignment. That's where the real work has to happen. And that's where good facilitation can really help out get people to say, you know what? I see where you're coming from and I think we could flex because there might be some value there for us. We haven't, we haven't thought about it that way. Yeah, and and just to add on that, and then the way that we define purpose-driven partnership, right? It could be something very grandiose, or something as okay, we will be environmentally conscious energy producers, right? Some big sort of uh, brand title like that, right? Um, or it could be something very tactically driven by saying, okay, I want to improve my uh, operational. I want to do production optimization. I want to do uh, better planning. I want to be dynamic uh, cap, uh, capital allocation. I want like there are four or five examples, things like that that could be very tactically driven. And then you get alignment on those topics, right? So it could be something very big that two companies that are just, you know, agree like fundamentally on their long-term vision of being entities, like their values and everything is aligned. Or it could be something aligned specific challenges that need to be solved. And then you get alignment. Okay, I would like for you to join me. I'd like you to join me. We're gonna solve this one specific problem that is happening in our operations or something on how we're planning. So it just depends on, on that. And I think they're very, succinct examples of some of the industry challenges that we can uh, that at least we're working helping solve some of those things uh, um anything else guys um i'm going to open up a question to you i mean i think between jeff and i we discussed uh five best practices that at least we've come across to establish uh, successful partnerships uh we discussed having the right teams so up and down i could talk about two other organization we discussed culture we discussed having the right kpis we talked about the right project size the project teams talked about what a purpose-driven partnership could look like but anything else that perhaps you feel you'd like to uh, add on to this thing that you've come across as you've worked with other partners small big uh, i'll take us on a little bit of a different route um i'd say emotional intelligence and the reason i say that is because you just have to be very aware of when you're feeling uncomfortable when you're feeling uncomfortable your, your human nature will program to back away or engage and you know you're doing one of the two so <laughs> generally speaking when it comes to business you, you back away you say that's not something i'm going to engage in so if you are truly emotional intelligent and you're thinking about you know how your body how your mind is reacting to a certain engagement if it's making you uncomfortable instead of backing away i think you used the word earlier be curious you know ask questions you're like man this is this is i'm not liking this but i'm going to ask questions about this i'm going to i'm going to see where this goes because more times than not, through asking questions and being curious, you do find something that you that you kind of like. You know, like, okay, I, I see where this could go. I, I see what we're talking about now. I didn't think that and I didn't like that coming in, but you know, I've stuck around long enough to have a good conversation. And now I, my mind is open to some different possibilities. And then from there, you never know where it goes. And if, even if it doesn't at that point, then you've- You've got, explored it. Yeah, exactly. You've explored it. And Correct. I think if you explore things enough, you generally find things that work. So being emotionally aware, emotionally intelligent to, to how your mind and body reacts when you're put on guard is really important because then you can fight that back. You can push through it. You can have a real conversation around something and then the door's open. You never know where it can go from there. I think that's a great point. Having the emotional intelligence and then having a having willingness to have a dialogue mm -hmm, with mm -hmm. somebody um, to, to work towards the best possible outcome. Yeah, you're, and the emotional intelligence piece, not only recognize your emotions and your behavior, but be able to, to, to see somebody else and see what they might possibly be going through and be able to react to that to maybe help them. Absolutely. And you know what? If it was comfortable and if it was easy, it'd already be done. It would just be natural. You'd be doing it today. It just happens without ever really acknowledging you're doing it. But the things we're talking about, working with startups or, or new technologies, venture capital, stuff like that, um, they're uncomfortable for a reason. And, and they, they require really good awareness to be able to persevere through that. You know, something along a different track that, that comes to mind as we've had this conversation around innovation and partners, um, I can't help but think about digital transformation because um, that's been a been a buzzword for a while, right, in the, in, in, in the, the space, regardless of this industry or another one. Do you know, as I kind of think about digital transformation, I, I think that digital transformation has an innovation problem, right? When we think about, we've talked a lot about innovation and what it takes to do that. A lot of those same elements are exactly what digital transformation needs. As a matter of fact, digital transformation is really probably macro and micro innovations happening across an organization to do that. So when I think about 
real value transformation, whether it's in your core business or something you want to step out with, and whatever we call it, whether that's digital transformation or something else. I think this idea of, of innovation and how we accelerate it and how we apply it to our organizations is really key to actually achieving digital transformation, which I know for many organizations is a key element. It's a great point, Fashin. Yeah, and as, as it relates to digital transformation, and Ben, you touched on this earlier. Like it's difficult to bring a partner in that doesn't have the domain expertise of, of energy and some, and there, and there's struggles with that. There's also a lot of values with that, right? If you look at the digital transformation curve, the energy industry is at the tail end of that curve, right? That's not necessarily bad. We can learn from the other industries that have already gone through that curve. So be uh, be comfortable being uncomfortable with partners that are outside of the industry that can bring different perspectives in. So. And, and to that point, like the energy uh, energy sector. Um, where, where it's been on the innovation maturity profile over the years, it's probably fallen backwards a little bit. It's probably sitting in a more comfortable spot. Um, but energy uh, sectors change over time. Like, like think about uh, transportation. The automobile was high tech, 1900, high tech. And then, you know, it went about 60 years, 70 years of pretty low tech, no change at all. Just like, you know, barely creaking along there. Uh, but now at this point in time, when you think of the auto industry, you're probably thinking more high tech. You know, it's undergoing um, innovation and, and evolution as we speak. And that's just any sector. Sectors yeah. evolve and grow. Yeah, and, and Adapt Adaptive cruise is awesome. Ab yeah. Oh, yeah. man, that's fantastic. <laughs> A lot of things are awesome, really. The, the autopilot's pretty awesome, too. Yeah. But... Um, but, but sectors, uh, they modulate and they move around. And I think we're in the middle of a paradigm shift right now. And we probably even acknowledge it, but we probably don't acknowledge how big of a shift it is that we're undergoing right now. And that's the exciting part, right? Yeah, it is really exciting, yeah. This concludes our discussion. Um, Adnan and I would like to thank Afshin, Ben, and Brandon for your valuable insights and contributions to today's discussion. Um, I would also thank our audience for your, for your time watching. We hope you found the conversation as robust as we did, and we hope you'll join us for future episodes of The Next Imperative. Thank you. Very good. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Yeah, thank you guys. Thank of course. Absolutely. Pleasure having you. Good stuff.